we have my two friends, Bertel Ullman, who will uh, speak uh, finally. And uh, we're going to lead off uh, with Michael Perlman. My voice is louder than theirs. That's why I'm uh, acting as <laughs> safe. I want to begin with an apology to my two panelists. Uh, we spent an irrational amount of time trying to hammer out what our titles should be. And each of us had a particular way of looking at the problem. We can barely Michael, hear you. I'm sorry, I thought this would work out. <laughs> Yeah, just get closer to the microphone. Just, just speak right into it. Okay, is this better? Yes. Yeah. Good. An inch. Um, thanks for the technology. Uh, Michael, of course, wanted us to be talking about junk economics, which I thought was a brilliant idea uh, about junk economics. Bertel introduced the idea of sin, and uh, I stubbornly rejected that. And so we went round and round and round until everybody exhausted each other. So I'll try to take a few seconds and talk about sin in economics. And uh, <clears throat> the third is about junkification. And I'll talk about what I consider to be the first episode of junkification of economics. And then the thing I wanted to have in the time was to compare economists to carnival barkers. <laughs> now we have a carnival barker in chief sitting in the White House. And uh, I think that's a very important part of economics. So right, right now, uh, one of the stupidest things ever imagined by economics was from Arthur Laffer, who grew up about 25 miles from where I did, but I never met him then. Uh, You're descending into and Raffer was the one who said he was coming closer to the mic. Yeah. Lean more into the microphone. Okay, Laffer was the one who said Laffer was the one who said, all you have to do is cut taxes and you can take care of the government deficit. Because the economy will grow so fast that everybody will prosper. And today um, Arthur Laffer is being revived by uh, Carnival Barker in Chief. It's never worked. And people fall for it every time. So I thought I'd start out talking about the first stage of junkification of economics. One thing, it's not really part of our panel, but I'll tell you that a lot of economics has to be with just trying to act against uprisings workers. In fact, um, in this sense, Karl Marx is the father of modern economics. So in, in the case I'm talking about, a man named Francis Horner, who was part of the Bullion Committee. The Bullion Committee was the top economic thinkers in Parliament. <coughs> Horner was asked to do a new edition of Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. Now, before the French Revolution, nobody paid any attention to the Wealth of Nations. His theory of moral sentiments was considered to be a masterpiece, which it was. But the Wealth of Nations is really a harsh watch in many ways, with some very aggressive observations. So, Horner's asked, please redo Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations to give it more strength. And he declined. He said, if I were to do that, I would have to show off every <coughs> shortcoming in Adam Smith's book. And I do not want to do that until his work is done. What comes? I do not want to publish a book until Smith's work is done. done. Meaning, Smith will give the ammunition for those who don't like workers uprising to put it down. Hmm. So that was the first act of junkification, where it doesn't matter what the person says, as long as it fits into our ideology and into our program. There you have it, junk. 
in terms of sin, uh, there's a game called the ultimatum game. Maybe some of you have played it. The idea is you have a crowd of people and you divide them up into pairs. And one of each pair is given them some money. And the person with the money is encouraged to share some of the money with the other player in his pair. And if they don't offer a reasonable amount of sharing, the other person can turn it down and the first person gets nothing. Some psychiatrists, uh, psychologists were very interested in this. And what they saw was that economic students were extremely heavy on this selfish side. Just taking advantage of everybody else. And from that, there's a whole literature that grew up about the nastiness of the brains of economists. Mm -hmm. I won't go out and try to exclude myself. Um, I don't want to do it, probably. Um, but that's where sin comes in. The carnival barker, I don't have my computers put on, but the carnival barker part, I thought comes with a man named Lionel Robbins. Lionel Robbins was a very highly respected economist. <coughs> After World War II, he worked close to with John Maynard Keynes in negotiating Bretton Woods, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and the like. And he wrote a book, The Nature and Significance of science, Economic Science. Economics isn't a science. And in fact, when Robbins tried to explain how scientific it was, he gave us a nonsense paragraph. And what he said was that economics is based on indisputable information. It cannot be that. The information is that everybody is rational. And if everybody is rational, the economy will work out, and everybody will be prosperous. It's just indisputable information. Scientists go out and they look for real things and study it. And this is just something that comes out of, it, out of the air. And this becomes the book that economic graduates, I don't know if they still do, but certainly through the 60s, they did. Economics graduates were taught to read this book and to understand what economics really is and how scientific it is. Michael's junk is much more accurate than anyone who labels economics as science. Just count the number of Marxists you find in every Ivy League school. Yale often has one for a three-year term and then get one. You're fading out. You're fading out. You're fading out. It's very difficult to hear you. Now they're not there. What? All you have to do is, uh, is lean over into the microphone. Okay, I'm sorry about the microphone. Yeah, now, now I can hear you. Just let me know. You should probably move up as well. I can't hear you. No, I have friends who've been on a three-year term at the and they do it just for show, and then the show is over after a year or two. So there's a view um, there's an intense amount of weeding, in, an intense amount of weeding in the hiring of economists in academia, and people who are Marxists, socialists, leftists, even Democrats and have trouble getting a job. Whereas, our heroes, the Koch brothers, are giving millions and millions of dollars to economic departments, where required reading will include a great introduction to Ayn Rand. <laughs> <laughs> but they're giving millions of dollars to them. George Mason University. And they also have, when they take, when you take the money, Kirk Brothers have a good say about who gets hired and who doesn't. Three what? Who gets hired and who doesn't. It's very sad what's happened. If you go back to the 
late 19th century, you had some wonderful economists, best of which would be Thorsten Dudley, who had brilliant things to say and actually got themselves heard. That after the Red Scare, no, no. It's interesting also when we think about economics to think about the role of Karl Marx. So let me take a few minutes for that. Karl Marx was held responsible for the Paris Commune. He knew some of the people, but that didn't mean that he engineered the Paris Commune. After the Paris Commune, <coughs> okay, I'll keep watching your hand. Uh, after the Paris Commune, three very important economists, William Stanley Jevons, Valdas, and uh, the Austrian economist. The name will come back to me. Uh, Menger, Karl Menger, started what's called the Marginal Revolution. Not like the French Revolution. It was a revolution to make economics into a mathematical scheme in which uh, everything would happen by calculus. And really, it was the basis of what Robbins was saying when he was explaining what scientific about economics. So it was a response to Karl Marx. And uh, that changed economics. That was considered to be the first big step in making economics into a science. And it's not a science. It's a form of ideology under a facade of sophisticated mathematics and statistics, which is supposed to impress people enough to accept any kind of nonsense in economics. And it's very sad because there's some very bright people doing it. And they get off on the wrong track because they're trying to play the game. And the game is you do things like these earlier economists show how to protect society against workers. And we haven't made some, any progress. In fact, we have regress. And now we have a whole government based on this ridiculous kind of thinking where we have somebody who is a clown running the country and probably ruining the world at the same time. Let's pass it around so none of us <clears throat> take up too much of the time. Since Michael began talking about Arthur Laffer, uh, I should uh, give some anecdotes. Uh, I was uh, the balance of payments economist for Chase Manhattan Bank uh, for many years. Uh, and at a certain point, uh, there was one uh, bank economist who was very good on money, and that was John Exter, uh, senior vice president of Citibank. So one day, uh, we had lunch, and uh, he asked me whether I wanted to head the uh, British Bank. Uh, uh, a branch of uh, Citibank, which probably would have meant a life of alcoholism. Uh, <laughs> but he introduced me to the uh, head of the research department, and the one question he asked me uh, that was a determining factor in whether they'd hire me or not is, what do I think of Arthur Laffer? And I, didn't, I thought, well, I guess he's a laugh. Uh, I, was, I was turned down. Uh, I later had two occasions to meet Arthur, uh, on both occasions uh, with Herman Kahn, who uh, put us together on uh, the, same, uh, uh, the same program. And uh, Laffer was, with us, pretty embarrassed about the fact that uh, his ideas had been picked up uh, by uh, the crazies. He uh, seemed to know much more about uh, economics than uh, the Laffer curve uh, went on. But uh, when, uh, going back to the Citibank, uh, at Chase, I was uh, part of the Economic Research Department. When I left, they changed the name to Economic Research and uh, no, to uh, Publications and Public Relations. <laughs> and that's what Citibank's uh, Research Department was called, Publications and Public Relations. 
Well, uh, Exeter had wanted to hire me uh, to work on the balance of payments. They had, uh, the day I went there, I'm told, uh, uh, my boss at uh, uh, Chase had convinced uh, David Rockefeller to sell $25 million worth of uh, pounds, British sterling, because Harold Wilson uh, was in town and had promised that Britain would not devalue sterling. Uh, the first thing uh, extra said at lunch was, if Harold Wilson says we're not going to devalue, we're going to devalue this weekend, we've just sold $25 million of, uh, of sterling to some sucker. Uh, that was my boss. Uh, <laughs> David Rockefeller suggested he'd have a good uh, academic uh, future uh, when they were playing uh, golf. So uh, that uh, basically, you, you realize that anything that comes out of the bank is public relations for what they really want. And for them, uh, they were all for tax cuts because they knew that whatever the tax collector cut was going to be available to be paid in interest, uh, especially on real estate, uh, but also for corporate uh, interest. So uh, many years later, I began to write the book that became uh, uh, Der Sector, what's the English, uh, Killing the Host. Uh, and I, uh, submit, uh, I was asked to write a book on the fictitious economy by uh, the British uh, editor of uh, Yale University Press. And uh, uh, part of the book uh, was the, diction uh, the prototype for this dictionary. And uh, the book was submitted to a uh, reader. Uh, off the record, I was told it was Paul Krugman. Uh, and uh, he said, you cannot publish the book. There is no such thing as a commercial bank creating credit. Commercial banks are savings banks. No bank creates credit. Uh, he uh, then uh, got in a long uh, uh, argument with my colleague Steve King, uh, which is on YouTube. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's all printed. It's just absolutely wonderful, where Steve explains that, of course, banks create credit. That's where all the debt comes from. That's what banks produce. Their product is debt. Uh, Krugman didn't get it. Krugman also said that I talked about economic rent. And anybody who talks about economic rent must be a member of the Henry George Cult. Uh, well, actually, what I was doing was talking about value and price. Uh, this was, and uh, this was the one great contribution of the wealth of nations was uh, to, uh, to start the British discussion of the distinction between value and price uh, through Ricardo, through Malthus, through John Stuart Mill. All of this ended up with Marx, and uh, Marx's theories of surplus value is really a history of theories of the distinction between value and price, with price being the excess of the mar uh, of uh, actual uh, price over the actual value, and the excess is called economic rent. And uh, before Marx, economic rent was denounced when it was paid to the landlords uh, and paid to the monopolists. And uh, what Marx did was say there was exploitation also uh, in uh, the form of wage labor, uh, that, that, that uh, industrial capital uh, was exploitative in a similar way to economic rent, but at least that uh, capital included the value of the labor embodied in it, which was the, co the concept of capital from Marx uh, through uh, uh, all of the classical economists, uh, through Adam Smith through all the classical economists. Well, I, I decided then that in the process of writing Killing the Host, uh, what was at issue was the whole vocabulary uh, that's been dumbed down. And uh, when I went to school in the 1950s, uh, Benjamin Lee Whorf, uh was uh, uh, looked at as sort of the best, the key of linguistic people. And Whorf's idea was that people's concepts, people's way of understanding reality, comes from the vocabulary that shapes the concepts in which they use. And I found out that uh, on almost all the lectures uh, that I gave, most of my time was uh, spent, had to be spent untangling the misuse of language and the transformation of language uh, into euphemism. Uh, and I'll, there are a number of key uh, phrases in this that uh, simply that have been inverted to mean exactly the opposite. Uh, for instance, free markets. Uh, when Adam Smith, Mill, and classical economists used the word free markets, they meant uh, they were part of what Marx said was the historical destiny of industrial capitalism. And that was to free society from the legacy of feudalism, to free society from landlords, from monopolists, and from uh, parasitic uh, banking. 
So uh, a free market was supposed to be uh, the government coming in, either taking direct ownership of the land, raw materials, resources, infrastructure, and banking, uh, so that to provide basic needs freely or at cost. That was the whole concept uh, of socialism beyond the market. Uh, today, uh, after uh, the last 50 years especially, uh, the word free market means a market free for predators, free for landlords to be free of, of taxes, free for corporations not to be regulated, free for, for uh, essentially exploitation to take place. You have an inversion of the classical, uh, uh, the classical use of the term. That's exactly why the history of economics has been dropped from the uh, economics curriculum uh, of graduate students throughout the whole country. Instead of studying the history of economics, where people would be able to read the original, see that the uh, words have been inverted in an Orwellian form, uh, they've substituted mathematics, uh, which takes uh, uh, all of the existing vocabulary and the existing relationships for granted. Uh, one of the, uh, the related terms that's been inverted is reform. Uh, when I grew up in sort of all of the 20th century, 19th century, reform meant uh, uh, organizing labor unions, regulating the economy, uh, restructuring it along lines that uh, uh, one way or another was leading to socialism of one form or another. Today, uh, when reform is used, ever since Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, Reform means breaking labor union power. Reform means deregulating the economy. Reform means exactly the opposite, and stripping away uh, any uh, ability <coughs> of government uh, to regulate or steer the economy. Uh, if you look at uh, what the economy is, and you look at statistics, such as the national income and product accounts, uh, what the classical economists called economic rent, the landlords, Everything is called earnings, and whatever anybody makes, uh, including what Goldman Sachs uh, people make, uh, what uh, Donald Trump makes, uh, the more you can exploit uh, your, the customers, the more this is called earnings. This was not called earnings for a hundred years of classical economics. It was called economic rent. And uh, from Adam Smith to Ricardo, to John Stuart Mill, to Marx, the idea was that the supernumerary cost what Marx called false costs of production, should be subtracted from GDP because it's all a zero-sum game. Uh, what the finance, insurance, and real estate, the fire sector, uh, takes out of the economy actually uh, is merely tra a transfer payment. Uh, it's not really output. It's not value. Uh, there is no cost of production uh, when a bank uh, charges interest. Uh, there's no cost of production uh, when uh, to the, the uh, price of land and real estate soaring uh, in New York City. And without a cost of production, there's no value. There's simply a price empty uh, of value, and that's uh, economic rent. That's been dropped from the vocabulary. Uh, further down in the statistics, if you look at uh, disposable personal income, which uh, the uh, New York Times reported yesterday is going up, uh, disposable personal income means only uh, what the private sector earns after paying taxes. It means everything the private sector gets. Uh, most of what the wage earner gets is not disposable. Uh, what, after paying taxes, uh, what comes off the very top of the paycheck? Uh, they have the monthly nut. They have to pay uh, the rent or the mortgage. They have to pay the credit card. They have to pay the student loan. Uh, only uh, my calculations show that only about 25 to 30 percent of the average uh, wage earner in America is actually disposable on goods and services. Now, this uh, extraction of rent, this fire sector, uh, gives a uh, added dimension to what uh, Marx talked about uh, when he talked about uh, the inability of workers to buy what they produce. Uh, in volume one of Capital, Marx explains how uh, the objective of uh, employers on the one hand is to pay workers as little as possible, uh, but to the extent that they succeed, how are workers going to buy what they produce? The market will uh, shrink. Uh, today, the market is shrinking not simply by uh, exploitation by employers, uh, but it's shrinking uh, because 
of uh, uh, having to pay uh, rent, uh, 40 up to 40% of your income for rent, uh, another uh, 10 to 20% uh, for various uh, interest charges. Uh, this leaves less and less uh, available, and that's why the economy is shrinking. Well, you're not going to get the idea, the whole concept that the economy can be in what's called secular stagnation or shrinking is sort of uh, ruled out of people's vocabulary by thinking of the economy in terms of business cycles. And in a business cycle, the economy goes up and down, and if something goes down, uh, the implication is it's going to automatically rise. Uh, Marx did not, although Marx was the first person to uh, uh, describe uh, the uh, business cycles as a result of uh, the periodic collapses, uh, which he attributed largely to finance uh, and capital, uh, he didn't believe that the economy was self-stabilizing. Uh, today, uh, when people study economics in graduate school, uh, all of the uh, mathematics that they have to study assumes that the economy is in equilibrium and if there's a downturn, that automatic equilibrating forces are going to restore it uh, automatically. That means there's no need for government policy. There is no need for government regulation. That means if you leave everything to Wall Street, uh, sent to the economy, which means Wall Street, uh, that uh, the, they will revive the economy. So what you have today as a result of free markets is a centrally planned economy, more centrally planned than anything that was uh, uh, thought of, conceived a century ago, but the central planning is not by government. The central planning is uh, by Wall Street and the financial interests. And instead of uh, 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 representing the dynamic of industrial capitalism as Marx described, it turns out that Marx was overly optimistic. Uh, he expected the destiny of capitalism to be to, uh, to industrialize banking, to take banking, and instead of usurious banking, predatory, extractive banking, as he described, he said uh, the role of banks is going to change to finance capital formation, and the financial sector is going to merge with industry, and as um, uh, most of the socialists who followed Marx at the time, up until World War II, especially in Germany, uh, World War I, especially in Germany, imagined that banks would actually be uh, the planning nexus out of which socialist uh, management would evolve. Uh, uh, because socialism was going to begin by taking over the banks, using their uh, planning and their financing as the key to uh, modernizing and industrializing uh, economies. And uh, that, uh, it, it, World, World War I changed all of this. Uh, America went on to the side of England, not Germany, and in the aftermath of the war, uh, banking throughout uh, the West took the form of Anglo-American banking. That is, uh, real estate and stock market promotion, short-termism, not the industrial banking that Germany and Central Europe uh, had pioneered, uh, and not the kind of industrial banking that I was going to lead uh, to socialism. So uh, the result was a kind of not only uh, asset stripping of the economy, but uh, what, uh, in order to engage in this anti-government uh, asset stripping, they've had to dumb down the uh, vocabulary and extricate uh, a, a number of words uh, that used to be critical. If you look at uh, Adam Smith uh, uh, wrote The Wealth of Nations after he went to uh, France and met the physiocrats, uh, and uh, were convinced that uh, the landlords were uh, retarding the growth of industrial pro progress because if the landlords ended up uh, with all of the work, more and more of the workers' budget to pay for food, the workers were not going to have enough money to uh, buy their goods, but more importantly, the cost of labor was going to go up and up and up as a result of landlord exploitation. Uh, and uh, Adam Smith said, uh, was said that if there's any group that should be taxed, it should be the landlords. He said the rise in rent is purely extractive. Uh, the rise in real housing prices uh, is, uh, is extracted. Uh, and uh, that was elaborated by Ricardo. And Ricardo was the lobbyist uh, for the banks uh, at this time. Uh, he was a member of parliament, uh, essentially to represent the banking interests. Uh, and uh, he, uh, at that time, the banks uh, had thrown in their lot with industry because 
Banks since the medieval period had made their profit by uh, foreign trade financing, uh, by uh, because uh, under uh, medieval canon law, an agio, a foreign exchange uh, charge, was uh, not considered uh, uh, interest and was permissible under the law. So banks had developed uh, international trade. <coughs> Ricardo, in promoting uh, and coming out with a, a junk economics of uh, uh, the division of labor uh, thought that if England could be the workshop of the world, it would export manufacturers, uh, turn other countries into raw material suppliers. Uh, but for that, it needed to uh, fight against the landlord class and uh, prevent uh, feed uh, labor at the lowest possible price. Uh, and it didn't matter that if labor couldn't buy the products of British industry because uh, the products of British industry would be sold abroad to uh, uh, North America and to other countries. Uh, that failed to industrialize, like Portugal. And so uh, Ricardo drew a mathematical uh, example of free trade uh, where uh, England would export uh, uh, wool and manufacturers to Portugal, which would produce wine. And uh, in Ricardo's example, Por Portugal won. It was exploiting the other countries. Uh, so the, the, the moral uh, for Ricardo was if you don't industrialize, if you just uh, continue to be a raw material supplier, you'll get, uh, you'll get richer faster. Uh, uh, Malthus, uh, of all people, uh, is a, the lobbyist for the landlord class, uh, uh, said no. Uh, the uh, landlords are going to uh, invest more and more of their rents in actual capital uh, formation and modernizing agriculture and turning it into agribusiness. Well, we, we, uh, all of you who uh, see old films about uh, Britain in the Victorian area knew that uh, landlords didn't do this at all. They bought uh, foreign luxuries, uh, they bought coachmen, and, and Malta said, where would uh, the English economy be if there weren't landlords able to hire coachmen and tailors and servants and butlers? Uh, that, that was uh, his idea. This was the first real trickle down. Uh, theory. And almost all the, all the junk economics today can be traced down to these early arguments uh, among the classical economists. Uh, in every case, uh, the, the trickle-down people lost. In every case, the uh, apologists for the banks and the landlords lost. Ricardo's defense uh, of banking was that there can be no such thing as a balance of payments deficit, a chronic deficit, because it automatic stabilizes. Uh, if England pays uh, 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 money abroad than uh, other countries in interest uh, or military spending than other people, other countries will turn around and buy uh, ex uh, exports. Word for word almost, Ricardo's apology to the banks was uh, parroted by Milton Friedman, uh, who said there can be no such thing as instability. There's automatic uh, equilibrium, and of all the ec junk economic theories, the, uh, the mathematics of equilibrium is absolutely the worst. But I found that it was impossible to have a discussion about uh, this and to explain saving without uh, going in, uh, I'm not sure about the time, so let, let me know, uh, without going uh, into the vocabulary. Uh, even such thing as savings, there's, uh, uh, the New York Times uh, celebrates uh, every year the fact that the savings rate in America is going up, as if somehow people are so prosperous that they have more money in the bank. What they don't realize is that in the national income account, saving is uh, uh, counted as repaying a debt. And now that the banks are not making mortgage loans, all of a sudden, all of the mortgages that people took out in the years leading up to 2008 have to be repaid. And that repayment uh, and amortization of the mortgage is counted in the national income statistics as saving. So what the newspapers applaud is that people have more and more money means that they're more and more strapped and that the debt repayment is taking a larger and larger proportion of the income as if somehow this is a sign of prosperity instead of, uh, uh, instead of being debt strapped and debt deflation. And the result is that since, 19, uh, since 2008, all of the growth in the American economy uh, has taken the form of uh, interest charges. That the economy's grown by about 2%, but you can figure it yourself, if the economy grows by 2% a year, and the interest rate is 5 to 6% that people have to pay, on average, from the mortgage, the credit card, the student loan, then the, that means that the rest, 
the rest of the economy is actually shrinking. It's going down 97% one year, 97%. We're in a constant period of economic shrinkage, and all of this is counted by growth because the recipients of interest, the banks and the, uh, uh, the bondholders, are considered to produce the service of collecting the interest from you guys, uh, just as the landlord produces the service of collecting the rents. So the whole idea of everybody producing a service and uh, everybody earning what they make is uh, a basically uh, junk economics idea that is the foundation of almost all of the current uh, economic uh, discussion. So what's happened? Uh, we're, uh, if you look at the statistics of uh, debt and real estate, we're at the end of our growth period. Uh, there's, too, there's not enough money to buy uh, products. Uh, that's why you're having restaurants closing, small businesses closing, bankruptcy rates uh, rising. And uh, you, uh, all of this uh, is being applauded by a, an economic theory that's become dysfunctional. And it's the opposite of what economic theory was when people talked about socialism uh, a century ago. The whole idea of socialism was to take over uh, government in order to uh, prevent this kind of exploitation. Uh, today, you have parties that call themselves socialists all over the world, especially in France, in Europe, uh, the Labour Party under uh, Tony Blair. Uh, I, uh, they've uh, embraced privatization. They, their, their political platform is the diametric opposite of everything that was considered socialist when I was growing up uh, uh, 60 years ago. Uh, and all of this junk economics is wrapped in a kind of uh, mythology. Uh, the, if you're following uh, Donald Trump's uh, argument these days, uh, the idea that uh, government budgets deficits are somehow bad. Uh, the last time, and that government surpluses or balanced budget is good. The last time we had a budget surplus was under Bill Clinton uh, in the last years of his administration. And running a surplus means the government sucking money out of the economy. Uh, every government uh, in the world in the last hundred years has increased uh, the public debt, has spent run deficits constantly. That's what uh, supplies the economy with enough money that exploitation can take place uh, in the private sector as long as uh, this is uh, balanced or offset by government spending on the public sector. All of that is denied by uh, the kind of models that the uh, Republicans are used. Uh, the idea that uh, Social Security should somehow be financed as a user fee. Uh, the whole idea of government social spending is to subsidize people who could not otherwise afford uh, basic needs. And if you say uh, the poor have to pay for all of their welfare, uh, the uh, labor has to, uh, has to not only pay for Social Security, but it has to pre-save creating billions of dollars of budget surplus that the government can then use to cut taxes on the higher brackets, you realize that uh, this is the great fraud that Alan Greenspan uh, promoted. No wonder he was applauded so much, uh, because uh, he imposed the uh, FICA uh, wage withholding of over 15% now of your paycheck that's used to finance the government. Uh, and the, uh, the only person who could see a uh, politician who could see through all of this economic flim-flam with George Bush. And he said, you know, the money's really not there. We spent it. Uh, <coughs> there isn't any Social Security. It's all part of the government budget. And the fact is that uh, it, the government, when it pays Social Security or public health, basically prints the money. Uh, that's uh, the essence of modern monetary theory, which uh, we teach at the University of Missouri in Kansas City. Uh, Paul Krugman doesn't uh, believe in it uh, because he doesn't think the government can create money any more than banks create money or income. The idea of the Krugmans of the world and uh, uh, people, uh, uh, Krugman is to the right of Milton Friedman. Wow. He said the government should not create money to pay into the economy or to pay the people. Only the banks and bondholders should be able to lend out their savings. And he said this is good because if you lend out savings, the, uh, the economy will spend it. As if somehow by lending out the savings, the rich people have been able to consume. Uh, and the fact is that uh, savings, when rich people save, we're back to the, uh, what Malthus said. They really don't spend it into the economy. 
They buy more real estate. They buy stocks. They buy bonds. They uh, buy uh, junk Andy Warhol movies. Uh, and you have just a, uh, an inversion of uh, everything that sort of the government says. The fact is, I, I think I uh, run up out of time now. So uh, where do we go from here? Uh, I wrote the book uh, and the companion volume on uh, telling the host because I, if the debts are left in place, uh, you, you cannot even have enough of industrial recovery to have a, so, uh, a socialist revolution. We're, we're in a constant stagnation. Uh, that's what the, the Tea Party is all about. It's amazing that the left wing, uh, that the, the Democrats, have not uh, picked up on the fact that there's exploitation, that the economy cannot recover, and they cannot recover largely because of their own policies. Uh, the policies of uh, uh, President Obama, when he refused to, re he promised to write down the debts uh, when he was running for president in 2008, he then broke the promise, did not write down the junk mortgages as he promised. He left all the debts in place, and leaving them in place is why this, uh, there has not been a recovery, and why the so-called uh, recovery, the growth in GDP, entirely to Wall Street, entirely to the upper 5% of the population, uh, has not trickled down and is impoverishing the economy instead of uh, enriching it. First, a few words about Michael's book. The title's maybe the greatest title I've ever seen. Uh, I don't know if people have seen or heard the subtitle, which is as good as the title. The title is J is for Junkie Economics. And the subtitle is A Guide to Reality in an Age of Deception. And we just heard about that. I'm going to criticize Michael's views a little bit, so I want to begin by complimenting him on his great, but I really think it's a great work. <clears throat> there may be hundreds, if not thousands, of different kinds of dictionaries available today, <clears throat> but I can think, I can't think of any that is more valuable in helping us understand the capitalist world in which we live than Michael's new dictionary, J is for Junk Economics. And it does so not by writing another book on how our society works, who it helps and who it harms, though all of this comes through as well, but by showing us how mainstream economists think and where and why and how often they are mistaken. Laying out how these economists and their capitalist bosses think, of course, is internally related to how they act in their dealings with the rest of us. But it's often necessary to focus on their ideas long enough to bring out the main connections between them. For it is only then that we can get a clear view of the bigger picture or, social, or the social economic system to which all such ideas belong and be in a position to make a thorough critique. But, but, and now the rest of my views on my group's work. We do have some disagreements about what, well, not so much about what he says, but what he doesn't say and what he doesn't do. Uh, and unfortunately, this has some important negative implications for what he does say. 
the social economic system to which we all belong. Uh, and the, uh, the offense of the system, uh, you know, the kind that Michael was criticizing, uh, I want to call the ideology. And the system in which this ideology exists is, of course, capitalism. But, and here I need to replace Hudson's framework for dealing with such ideas that we heard in his talk, and you'll we'll see we'll develop much further. But I want to now replace Hudson's idea for dealing with these ideas with Marx's. But for Marx, there are two capitalisms. Two capitalisms? What can Omen mean by that? I mean that Marx devotes most of his time, especially in his more theoretical works such as Capital, but also in the unpublished works such as the 1844 manuscripts and the Grundrisse, in which he prepared to write Capital, to analyzing the workings of what might be called capitalism in general. Capitalism in general. Or the interaction of those features of capitalism that remain more or less the same from the time two or three or two to three hundred years ago, it became the dominant mode of production in one or more societies to the time which is still up ahead when it will cease to be so everywhere. Among the main features of this version of capitalism, we find the following. <clears throat> Profit maximization inscribed in the very function of capital. Exploitation based on the capitalist's retention of the surplus value produced by workers. The production of value in general, meaning that everything produced by alienated labor functions as someone's private property and can be bought and sold as such. This, by the way, is the qualitative labor theory of value as distinct from the better known quantitative version of the theory. Next, the metamorphosis of value and with it the relations of alienated labor contained within it into the variety of forms such as commodities, money, capital, and even wages that are visited in the process of circulation. The fetishism of commodities, in which the material objects affected by the metamorphosis of value are often viewed as having a kind of life and will, indeed a hostile one, in their interaction with the workers who produce them. And finally, at least in this list, the ongoing class struggle between workers and capitalists that is rooted in the opposing places in their opposing places and functions in our system and the incompatible class interests that come out of this. Now, don't worry, I'm going to have a chance to read that list again. But this is what capitalism in general focuses on. What I'm treating as the second capitalism, I want to get clear why I'm talking about two capitalisms and I'll go back to each of them. What I'm treating as the second capitalism develops inside the first one, not after the first one, inside the first one, and represents a largely separate interaction and development that goes on between the distinctive features of each temporal stage of capitalism, with each stage lasting anything from 20 to 50 years, the rise and fall, really the replacement 
of what might be called the recent or modern version of capitalism coincided with the first appearance of capitalism in general, that list of things I talked about earlier as being a part of capitalism in general, which lasts, that is, those things continue from the time that capitalism became the dominant mode of production to today and beyond today to whatever time and place a change in the capitalist system will occur. <clears throat> Uh, the most distinctive features of this stage, of our stage, no, the most recent stage of what I'm calling uh, modern capitalism, the most distinctive features of the stage of capitalism in which we are now all living are the following. The rise in power of financial capital over industrial capital. It's been around for a long time, but it never became as dominant as it is today. A lingering economic crisis with its implications for jobs and other important elements in our lives. Globalization, again, that's been around for hundreds of years, but a quantity quality change has occurred in the character of globalization, and partly because of other things I'm about to mention, like Automation, which again, advances in technology were occurring long before Marx wrote, but there's a quantity quality change and now we have a return to describe that quality quality, quantity quality change, which is automation. <clears throat> Containerization, which is almost as important as uh, automation, the ability of ships to carry any kind of goods from one part of the world to another, they don't break in the voyage because of the kind of containers in which to pack while on the ships. <clears throat> Climate change, of course, most of which is the result of capitalists maximizing their profits and treating things they don't have to pay for as externalities. <clears throat> the spread of nuclear arms, which I also consider an important shape of part of this group of new phenomena, relatively new phenomena, which have to be good in terms, of their, in terms of their interaction. They don't exist independently. They have important interactions with each other. <clears throat> and finally, in this short list, this is the short list, <clears throat> the quantity quality change <clears throat> in both the variety and the effectiveness of the misleading ideologies to which we are all subjected not only in the universities, and certainly not only by the economists, but throughout society, throughout society. And the list is very long. I won't go into that list. The complexities of working with two capitalisms, which coexist, the older one, the more general one, overlapping, the more recent one, the more specific one, complexities of working with two capitalisms also require Marx to use diff two different methods <clears throat> for studying them. Most of what we have called <clears throat> modern capitalism belongs to the world of appearances. Its main features, those that I just listed, are directly observable not only by Marx, but by any careful observer using standard empirical methods. And a good deal of what Michael has been talking about in describing it. But the same is not true. The same is not true of the main features of capitalism in general. And again, we go back to that list in a moment. For the main features of capitalism in general all involve relations and processes that carry the reader both in space and through time well beyond what can be observed directly with our senses. With such extended relations and processes, the first step is to break them up into the manageable units 
that make the overarching system to which they belong much easier to comprehend. This is, of course, the work of Marx's dialectical method. This is not the place to expound on this method beyond saying that this is how Marx studies a subject matter, capitalism in general, that is largely hidden from us and also, though to a lesser degree, the more important relations and interactions that go on in modern capitalism, and finally, the interaction, to the extent it exists, between capitalism in general and modern capitalism. I would also just like to briefly note that uh, <clears throat> there is also another difference in the way Marx studies uh, these two capitalisms, and that has to do, uh, firstly, with uh, what uh, Marx, what, what Michael basically focuses on, which is the kind of propaganda uh, which is presented as uh, science and uh, necessary uh, facts of the kind you can't criticize by the economists, the professional economists. Uh, and Marx talks about these people as he have nice praise for them. He talks about the, the equivalent of these people in his day who were much less numerous and, as we'll see, much less important in the spread of ideology. Uh, he calls them the, uh, the paid hirelings of capital. The paid hirelings of capital. They existed. He criticizes them. But the less important, the less important in the creation of ideology and the spread of ideology, then the workings of capitalism itself, the very workings of the capitalist system are primarily responsible for the spread of ideology. The capitalist system, particularly that part of it that we're calling uh, capitalism in general, more responsible for the development and spread of ideology than even the economists, believe it or not. And the kind of examples you find in Marx is what happens in the workers' beliefs that he is getting paid in full because the capitalist pays him by the hour that he works. He works X number of hours, he gets paid for all those hours in his check. Whereas, in fact, Marx shows that what the capitalist buys is uh, not these hours, but uh, the potential, the potential in labor, labor power and the potential uh, of what can be uh, produced in the, uh, uh, by that labor power uh, over the whole time that the worker uh, has a job with this capitalist. And that turns out to be, of course, much more than the amount that is returned to them if one considers, uh, as uh, the, uh, takes as the basis for payment, the amount of hours that the workers work. And that much more is, uh, of course, what marks that surplus value. <clears throat> but you find the same thing, let's say, in, uh, uh, in uh, the idea of equality before the law. Uh, and here it's uh, not from Marx, but one which is as good as anything that Marx produced. Uh, it comes <clears throat> from the uh, Anatole France, you know, the French novelist uh, of the turn from the 19th to the 20th century. And Anatole France. Uh, that says uh, that, that the, uh, 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 the, uh, the law. The law. Thank you. The law <laughs> in its the law majesty. That, that, uh, thank you. The law in its majesty forbids uh, the rich as well as the poor from sleeping under bridges and stealing bread. I repeat that. Uh, Mac Marx said it better. The law and its majesty forbids the rich as well as the poor from sleeping under bridges and stealing bread. In other words, by looking at only a small piece of what is going on, in this case, what's actually written in the law, and not considering the context, the framework, the conditions in which what's written in the law must be understood, one arrives at a very distorted view of what one is uh, supposed
supposedly repeated. And uh, this happens in a number of features in the capitalist society, and Marx gives more attention to those. Uh, and I think we have to continue insofar as what I've been calling capitalism in general still exists, more or less as it did in Marx's time, uh, then the workings of capitalism uh, probably play a bigger role in the kind of ideology that Obad and Michael have been criticizing than the, uh, than the role of, uh, however insidious, however widespread in the academy, than the role performed by the three hirelings of uh, the capitalist system. <clears throat> Both of the two capitalisms sketched here have their own laws of motion, which carry them from where they began to where they end. In his introduction to Capital Volume 1, Marx said his main aim in writing Capital was to, quote, lay bare, an interesting expression rather than explain, was to lay bare the law of motion of modern society. Again, this is, as far as I know, it's the only time Marx specified so clearly what his aim in a major work was. I mean, that's the same purpose, the purpose of Captain Warren. His aim is to lay bare the law of motion in modern society, unquote. Which weren't as different from Marx's day. Now, he says that modern society doesn't mean the woman has done. Right. what I think Marx means by modern society up into two categories. <clears throat> but I think the reason he does it and treats them more or less uh, together uh, is because uh, they, to these two, weren't as different in Marx's day as they have become in recent times. I think that the versions of modern, what I would call the modern capitalism, have uh, gone further and further away, become more or more distinct from what they were when they first emerged uh, on uh, capitalism in general, and as they were during the time when Marx, uh, when Marx was writing. But what stands out most sharply in this quote is the priority given to motion or change and the range of matters extending to the entire society that need to be brought into any adequate explanation of what is taking place. In other words, it's not enough to talk about economics. It's not enough to talk about the economy. Uh, none of the features of modern capitalism emerged in a finished form. And it is only when they develop up to a point and start to interact or speed up their interaction with some of their neighboring features that we can speak of a new stage of capitalism having arrived. But it should be clear that this new stage of modern capitalism does relatively little to alter the interaction that goes on in capitalism in general. The two capitalisms coexist. They interact some, but that hasn't had a decisive effect on their evolution so far. But the kind of effect that a major change in either of them is likely to have on the other is very, very different. For example, the current version of modern capitalism could change a lot, as it has, and that for the better, in the last hundred plus years of social democratic reforms in countries throughout the world. But, as we see, they have not had much effect on the evolution of capitalism in general. All of these improvements have been capitalism in general pretty much as it has been since Marx's day. And without that, it has proved relatively easy for capitalists and their allies to respond to the last couple of economic crises by withdrawing most of these reforms, which is, of course, where we are at right now. In short, reforming modern capitalism without radical changes to capitalism in general can only produce modest improvements and even they are likely to be only temporary. While making capitalism in general our main target, he 
because of the kind of changes that would involve, like doing away with private property and the means of production, would also deprive the capitalist class from doing all the terrible things that they're doing within modern capitalism. No one is saying, here's my conclusion, <laughs> no one is saying that redirecting our main critique from modern capitalism to capitalism in general is easy. But it is necessary in a world where some of the main features of modern capitalism have come to threaten the very existence of human life on our planet. And it is possible now in that the worsening and contradictions in capitalism in general, with a little help from those in modern capitalism, like automation and climate change, have created a hostility to all kinds of capitalism, especially among the young, that hasn't existed in the 1930s. And I'll conclude by sharing with you an interesting, no, a very important uh, study which I recently <coughs> heard about that has not been published as far as I can see in most of the progressive journals and other sites which, which I look at. Uh, a recent, this is it, uh, a recent European Union survey asked about 580,000 respondents in 35 countries whether they would actively participate in a large-scale uprising against the generation now in power. They didn't want to mention capitalism. It was after all the European Union had conducted it. So this was, this was the, the, the study. Uh, and uh, oh, and the, to be added to the question, if this uh, uprising occurred in the next few days or months, <laughs> More than half of the 18 to 34 year olds said yes. <laughs> this is a 34 countries. More than half of the 18 and 34 year olds said yes. In Greece, there was a Greek friend who said this to me just over a week ago, 67% said yes. Well, this isn't your grandfather's or even your father's world anymore. That's not from my friend. That wasn't in the study, that's from me. Uh, but we are not going to be able to take advantage of such monumental changes in public opinion if some of our best Marxist economists, and few are more better or more influential than my thoughts, if they restrict most of their criticisms and proposals for change to the problems that arise out of modern capitalism. We need their help. We need their help analyzing the workings of capitalism in general as well. Michael himself has noted on page 11 of his book, uh, yes, uh, um, Chains for Junk Economics, <coughs> quote, the essence of junk economics is a normal conceptualization, conceptualization of the economic. But what else is Michael doing by restricting himself so much, not entirely, but so much, to the modern capitalism and to basically the, the role, as terrible as it is, of the economists. He also says, Michael says on page 52, that the aim of a good deal of ideology is to avoid looking, quote, to avoid looking at the broad economy wide dynamics at work. That's what I've been saying. It's the broad economic dynamics of economics at work and economics and capitalism exists on these two levels. And we must criticize them both in the more important one. The reasons I've given is uh, uh, the, the capitalism in general. Some nice words about you, Michael. Right? Some nice words about you, you don't cut me. Having made my case to why we should all prioritize <coughs> capitalism in general, both in our work as scholars and activists, I am ready to admit that devoting some attention to the more pressing problems of modern capitalism is also necessary. And here, Michael's effort to unravel the ideology that passes for scholarly economics is, a, is should be, a model for all of us to talk about. Those of you who have been coming to the Raquel and Michael show for the last few years, <laughs> I recognize your faces. 
Uh, no, that they follow a, a, a usual format. I usually uh, outline my ideas. Uh, Bertel uh, immediately grasps your attention by saying he's going to show uh, a disagreement. But the fact is, we always agree, end up in total agreement. <laughs> Everything Bertel says is quite right. Uh, uh, when he said that I'm uh, not talking about uh, the, uh, it, the laws of motion of industrial capitalism in my book, he's right. And there's a reason for that. What I, uh, that the laws of motion of industrial capitalism, as they appeared a century ago, have been interrupted. The vested, the rentiers have fought back. The landlords have fought back. The bankers have fought back. The monopolists have uh, fought back uh, against, uh, not only against uh, socialism, but in fighting against socialism, they fought back against the very laws of motion of capitalism that uh, Bertel is talking about. You have, instead of industry, uh, instead of banking being uh, industrialized and used to promote industrial growth, corporate industry has been financialized. Uh, the aim is asset stripping. Ninety, uh, in the last five years, 92% of corporate earnings uh, have been spent either on stock buybacks or in higher dividend payouts to increase the price of the stock. The aim, uh, or as Marx described, the aim of uh, weight of the capitalist is to employ wage labor, to uh, squeeze out a profit, that they then invest in yet more and more uh, uh, industrial capital that at a certain point uh, creates uh, overinvestment in a crisis. The exact opposite is happening today. You have underinvestment. That's why we have uh, uh, the stagnation. And uh, what I talked about is the fact that before we get to uh, the uh, socialist revolution of industrial capitalism, we have to deal with the fact that industrial capitalism is being stifled by the rentier economy, by the fire sector. And so my book is largely about how uh, the industrial capitalism's evolution into socialism is being stifled and uh, creating exactly the kind of uh, barbarism that uh, Bertel is talking about, the economy uh, leading to. So the question is whether it's capitalism uh, that's leading to this or a resurgence of neo-feudalism. Marx didn't talk about the dynamics of neo-feudalism or of uh, 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 even a financial uh, capital uh, takeover because he, he was an optimist. He expected industrial capitalism to solve uh, <laughs> <coughs> to free society uh, from the very classes that have ended up uh, fighting back in a counter revolution uh, since World War I. That's why a few years ago, Michael Perlman and I in, uh, went to uh, Turkey uh, for a uh, Thorstein Veblen conference to show that by the 1920s, uh, Veblen was pointing out wait a minute, look, uh, the, the problem is that uh, industrial capitalism is being perverted. Uh, that, uh, that most of the bank uh, lending and most of the investment is in real estate, not industry. Uh, the monopolists are taking over, the banks are mismanaging the economy, and capitalism is being mismanaged. Uh, uh, Marx hoped it would be managed well enough to evolve into socialism uh, by the 1920s. It was uh, apparent that this was not happening. That's really what uh, my book's about. And uh, uh, I, you're right, once we uh, solve the problem of uh, uh, the neo rentier the neo-feudalism society, then we can get indeed to exactly what Bertel is talking about. Wall Street represents a kind of mafia organization of capitalism. <clears throat> mafia in that virtually every CEO is afraid there might be an unwelcome move in their stock which could threaten the job of the CEO. The stock buybacks are for the same reason. Oh, I'm a great leader. My stock is up. Because I took all the profits and I bought the stock back, raised this price of stocks, but didn't do anything to invest to make the company better. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. And it's really not commented much. So much of rich now we have a financial system, and the financial system more than ever 
is being generated by computers. The financial system is being generated more than ever by computers to decide which stock to buy, when to sell it. People are at the margin. I did want to say something in my earlier talk about the ultimatum that came. It'll just take me a second. Marx played an inverse ultimatum game. When he got married, he and his wife went off and they had a little place for a few days and people would come there. And I don't know if Marx put it there or if his friends put it there, but there was a bowl of some kind. And people would put their money in the bowl. Marx never looked at the bowl until the next day and it was empty. So it was an inverse ultimatum game. And if the ultimatum game, the way it's played today, shows a sense of sin, this shows a sense of goodness in Karl Marx. And other people saw this goodness. His brother-in-law hated him and tried to do anything he could to destroy him, because Marx was just a dirty little Jew. And he was an aristocrat, and so was Marx's wife. Whereas uh, his brother, would send policemen over to investigate Marx. And they all came back with the same report. What a nice, charming man. I really liked him. I guess they were hired for more police students. <coughs> Before we have questions, let me just say a word. Sure. Uh, you can see how difficult it is to disagree with Michael. He says, well, let me disagree with you. Uh, before we do this, uh, I don't think that neo-feudalism is an adequate substitute for capitalism. Uh, I think we still have capitalism, and I have a place to put the materials that Mike brings forward uh, about the special uh, role, terrible role, that. Uh, finance capital is playing in the modern period. Uh, I, and, and I certainly dislike finance as much as Michael. Uh, I think, though, that uh, the distinction between these different kinds of capitalists needs certain qualifications, because most of the big capitalists, of course, have a lot of stock, and the stock is in different kinds of companies. Some of them are companies which are industrial companies, some of them are commercial companies, and some of them are banks. And, uh, and many of the big uh, industries have uh, developed divisions where they do banking. Uh, uh, some of the big car companies, of course, have uh, area, uh, part of the company where they lend money for people to buy their automobiles. So there is a, a lot of overlap between the different Factions, fractions of the capitalist class. But I think that the law of motion of capitalism, which Marx uh, focused on in trying to understand it and fight it, uh, has evolved, but it's evolved much more in what I've called the different versions of modern capitalism which have come along than in the basic uh, rules of capitalism in general, which continue pretty much as they were, as they uh, existed in Marxist time and continue to cause us our main problems. And uh, if we don't get rid of that, we haven't really done very much because the uh, capitalism will always come back as it has shown it can in the hundred years that social democrats were so proud of having had the uh, smallish victories in hundreds, well, in dozens and dozens of countries all over the world. And now these victories have been rolled back, and I think we have to see that that's what's going to happen again and again and again in ever-worsening situations, because uh, climate change and nuclear uh, arms, which are in so many different hands now, are not going to stay the same in the coming period as they are today. They're going to be much worse. Peking University. Uh, so two minutes, one minute. 
uh, all of a sudden you were given dictatorial powers in Washington, D.C. <laughs> what were your other tangible uh, steps that you would take to uh, alter the economy? Well, in terms of uh, successful debt cancellation, oh. <laughs> in terms of successful debt cancellation, uh, I've just finished a uh, history of the ancient Near East. Uh, every ruler of Sumer and Babylonia uh, from 2500 BC uh, down to about 1600 BC, and again uh, all the way into the 5th century BC, every ruler who took the throne began by a clean slate, canceling the debts, liberating the bond servants who've been uh, uh, served to their creditors for debts, and redistributing the land. The Babylonian word for this was Anduraro, uh, it's cognate the Hebrew Duror, which was the Jubilee year. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, we don't have any documentation really from the Bible or from archaeology as to uh, whether uh, Jubilee years canceled the debts in uh, Israel, but uh, Babylonia, Sumer, the Neo-Babylonian Empire, the Neo-Assyrian Empire, all canceled the debts, and, that, and the rulers did this not because they were idealists. Uh, they knew that if they didn't cancel, the, they were talking about the personal debts, not business debts, uh, silver debts, but the grain debts owed by the population at large. The rulers knew that if they didn't cancel the debts, then the uh, uh, debtors would have to be working for the creditors, not available to perform corvée labor for the crown, which was the public labor that uh, uh, built uh, everything from the uh, temples to the pyramids uh, to the city walls, uh, and they would not be able to serve in the army. Way down uh, by uh, the third century BC in Greece, uh, military tactics said if you want to uh, can conquer a city, uh, you cancel the debts. Uh, if you want to defend the city, you also promise to cancel the debts. Otherwise, the population is not going to be on your side and they'll go over uh, to the opposite. So all of uh, 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 Western civilization before Rome uh, ended up uh, canceling the debts, and that's how they maintained a, uh, a citizenry that was uh, free from bondage, uh, except uh, for uh, short-term uh, bondage, basically. In modern debt cancellations, by far, uh, the, the biggest one was what's called the German economic miracle. The Allies canceled all internal debts of Germany, in 1948, except for wages that were owed by the employers to the labor force. That debt cancellation is what made German, uh, uh, the German economy more debt-free than uh, any other Western economy. So uh, that's certainly the best. Uh, in Greece, I was working with uh, the left wing of the Syriza party, uh, uh, urging that uh, the debt be repudiated on the grounds that the uh, uh, it's almost all owned by the Troika, that is the IMF uh, and uh, the European Union. The IMF economists uh, unanimously, uh, the economic division of the International Monetary Fund, recognized that the debt was fraudulent and could not be paid. Uh, and however, the uh, head of the IMF, uh, Dominique Strauss-Kahn, wanted to run as president of France, and most Greek debts at that point were owed to the uh, French banks. And so Strauss-Kahn uh, uh, worked with the European Union to save the French banks, the German banks, the Italian banks, and the other bondholders uh, holding Greek bonds, and uh, said uh, the IMF took them over. Uh, I think that the Greece's position should have been, okay, uh, uh, Strauss-Kahn said that he violated and changed the IMF rules because of a systemic problem uh, where not paying the debts would threaten the system. Well, if uh, the system was threatened, the system should pay for it. Germany, France, Italy should pay for it because it was to save them, not the Greek people. Uh, so uh, certainly, the example of I'm going to be brief. There's a YouTube video. There was a meeting in Vienna uh, a few weeks ago with uh, my colleague Steve Keen, uh, another uh, colleague, uh, Richard Werner, all uh, urging this. I'm sure you, uh, on my website, I think you can access uh, the video uh, where we outline the concept of odious debt. Uh, and then today, you could say, I think that most of the junk mortgage debt was odious debt. 
the debts were kept on the books uh, because uh, uh, Obama supported the bondholders against uh, uh, and the bankers against uh, the people who voted for him. To an extent that when uh, Sheila Baer, the head of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, uh, tried to close down Citibank as a uh, bankrupt criminal organization, uh, Geithner and, and uh, uh, the Secretary of the Treasury, Geithner, appointed by Obama as uh, Wall Street's bag man, uh, locked her. And so Sheila Baer, in her uh, autobiography about this, wrote, I learned it's all about the bondholders. Well, that's what the economy is all about today. It's about the bondholders. It's not about the industrial capitalists. It's about the bondholders that are stifling uh, industrial capitalism and uh, the overall uh, market economy. Thank you. One quick question. Where do you see things move forward with uh, President Trump? I have no. I have no idea what's going to happen. Uh, I, uh, I don't. I, I've talked to people. Uh, Washington, including Republicans, no politician I talk to has no, any idea at all about what's going to happen. So we just don't know. Yes. yes. Um, talk a lot about the fire sector and the industrial capitalist sector. Um, the tech sector, yep. which doesn't create a tangible product, but isn't in the it, it's intellectual property stuff. Where does that fit into your analysis and particularly going forward? Well, technically it's, a, it's an industry. Technically it's a capitalist industry, uh, employing labor to make a profit, but it's, uh, now that we don't have uh, the progressive era's anti-monopoly legislation anymore, most of the earnings of the tech sector are uh, uh, monopoly rents uh, because they've been able to monopolize uh, uh, technology. Uh, that was something that didn't exist uh, in antiquity. Everybody was copying everybody else. Uh, uh, the luxury uh, uh, trade at that time that uh, Mesopotamia uh, earned its wealth for it were textiles. Uh, and textiles, of course, is all design. So uh, you, you have, uh, uh, I, I think a hundred years ago, if somebody would have told uh, futurists or economists or politicians uh, about uh, the tech sector uh, emerging, uh, people would have imagined that it would have had to be done by the government, and in fact, the government did uh, start it. It began as ARPANET. Uh, it began as uh, the government uh, put it together, and then, uh, just as in the case of uh, pharmaceuticals, turned over all of the research free to be monopolized. So the tech sector is sort of half in the industrial sector and half in the landlord sector, rent extractors. Well, you say that the bondholders are holding back industrial capitals, but isn't it the crisis of overproduction or the fact that money cannot be invested profitably in building new steel plants and auto plants at the rate of profit? Well, sure, and why can't money be invested prop, uh, uh, profitably today? Marx printed out that uh, the problem is it couldn't be invested proper, uh, profitably at the point where uh, there was a market failure. What's caused the market failure today? Uh, as I said, only between 25 and 30 percent of the workers' budget is available to buy goods and services. So the market failure is uh, uh, coming not from what uh, uh, was expected a century ago, uh, or in the 19th century, uh, n not from uh, the exploitation of labor by the corporations uh, that occurs, that, that is, is the dynamic of industrial capitalism, but the, the vast charges for rent uh, and interest and fire sector payments uh, are uh, what is uh, behind the market failure today. If you, uh, why are all of the uh, stores along 8th Street closed down around the university area? Uh, when I came to New York 60 years ago, almost, uh, uh, had the, book, the bookstores, uh, the clothing stores, no, they're all boarded up. Nobody can afford it. How can you afford it if you're paying uh, NYU uh, tuition, if you're paying the student loan, uh, if uh, the uh, New York population is paying the average $4,500 rent uh, in New York? Of course, uh, there's a, a, a market failure. Um, I just want to take the opportunity to ask uh, Dr. Hoffman uh, and you all, <coughs> 
I came across in the New Yorker when they were talking about the oligarchy 2.0 in Russia. Just a small diversion. The point that was made by one of the, I think, Russian economists was that Russia had become a feudal state. If all the oligarchs owe their allegiance to the economy essentially to pure personal loyalty, and they said they were describing Russia now as a feudal state. It actually makes sense to, uh, to you all. OK, the question was about Russian oligarchs. Uh, this is interesting because uh, <coughs> the final stage of Stalinism is kleptocracy. Uh, you have uh, the, the fact that uh, uh, Russian Marxism uh, became sort of a patter talk uh, for uh, uh, Russian nationalism, for uh, uh, wage labor against uh, the industrialists. Uh, Russian Marxism failed to analyze capitalism as it was developing uh, in the last half century. Did the, the, uh, the Russians have any idea at all that taking uh, American neoliberal advice meant deindustrializing, meant turning their economy into a, uh, a uh, raw materials exporter? Did they really have any idea uh, about uh, what was in store for them uh, by uh, saying kleptocracy is good for you because it turns the public uh, wealth into private hands and the magic of the marketplace, which uh, means flight capital uh, and uh, deindustrialization. Uh, it shows that uh, uh, the absence of uh, uh, Marxist analysis uh, in Russia, that uh, it, it all ended in uh, the logical final stage of Stalinism. Can I come in Oh, yes, we have to let uh, Sasha give a response to that. First of all, uh, <coughs> thank you very much. I didn't expect that I will be among the speakers, but this is a big honor for me. Uh, very briefly, uh, first of all, uh, in Soviet Union, we had official Marxism, and this official Marxism was interconnected with the real Marxism, like, uh, at, okay, no connection, yeah, generally speaking. And it was simply servant of the official uh, masters of our economic, social, and political life. It's the same like to say that uh, your masters, your scholars who are serving your masters are real ideologically uh, supporters of liberal values, real freedom, real democracy, and so on. For them, this is, doesn't matter. For them, it doesn't matter money, career, and so on. The same was with Soviet official masters. With uh, real critical Marxism, which we had in Soviet Union, it was not connected. And critical Marxism said that it will be a terrible result of any changes from the Soviet system to liberal capitalism. And now we are talking this permanently. And this is my dream to present one time critical Marxism, Soviet Marxism for you, because it is nearly not known, it was not translated into this. So this is first remark. Second very important remark. Russia is caricature on the West. You know, if you have big nose in Russia, it will be like Boratina. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. So that's why Russia is a very good example to analyze the United States. Everything in caricature form. I'm finished. Uh, so if you want to have this analysis in English, I will write email and it will not take time because he will kill me. I'm not speaker. <laughs> <laughs> Good idea. Think of uh, 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 Russia and Greece as America's future, uh, uh, especially Greece as America's future, certainly Europe's future uh, under the euro. Uh, we have two more uh, questions, and then I, I have another lecture in another uh, uh, venue. I just wanted your critique, uh, uh, love it. Love your critique it. or whether it's legitimate, the whole notion of universal basic income to address some of the problems that we see today. That's, that's, uh, uh, I'm all for universal uh, basic income. Uh, it can be afforded. It can be afforded simply by the government uh, uh, doing, print, uh, doing exactly what commercial banks do, printing the money and spending it into the economy. Universal basic income should be uh, a precondition for a successful industrial capitalism as it evolves into socialism. All for it. What was the long-term effect? Louder? What was the long-term effect on the, the current problem of industrialists doing self-financing of their expansion rather than using the banks? Uh, for the last uh, 
50 years, almost all of the capital investment in the American economy has come from retained earnings. Uh, this is an, uh, the junk economics that you have in textbooks show banks lending money uh, to a, a, a factory and uh, the factory employing labor walking in with lunch box as if there's a kind of uh, circular flow that used to be called Say's Law. Uh, but that's not, not uh, happened at all. Uh, you're, you're having a disconnect uh, between all of this, and this disconnect uh, is not what uh, was expected 100 years ago. People did not expect uh, industrial capitalism to have a relapse uh, into a, uh, a fight back by the North Yates. There's been a relapse, and that's the problem. problems are not just in economics, though they're related to the economics. Uh, that the situation is getting so bad that now we're trying to make one more small reform. Uh, and unfortunately, I think too much of my com that comrade and your friend's solution uh, falls into that, uh, that sector. So we're making those minor reforms, the whole thing's going to blow up in our face, and we're going to realize that we're going to have to struggle for something bigger like getting rid of the goddamn capitalist system. <laughs> and I can kind of show that things are changing in a way so that the world this would always uh, seem to be impossible, it seems to be possible, as difficult as ever, but now possible because of a whole number of changes which are great, some of them of the kind that Michael was talking about. But these are what we have to focus on. What I want Michael to do is not write enough capital, I want him to spend some of, some of his enormous talent and great learning and great speaking ability on dealing with capitalism in general and the need to as quickly as possible get rid of capitalism and replace it with socialism and communism. Great place to end.